So I'd like to begin by thanking the uh, individual who was responsible for getting this lecture series started, who is our beloved Associate Dean for Student Affairs and Diversity here at Vermont Law School, Shirley Jefferson. I'd like to acknowledge her leadership in launching this series and keeping it going over the two years since the murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis police in May 2020, which is the event that precipitated this series. This horrifying loss triggered grief and outrage throughout the country and around the world. And it also triggered a groundswell of reflection, activism, and inquiry as many of our students asked themselves, how can I contribute to ending racial injustice? And I wanted to say a, a brief word about Dean Jefferson and her role in um, her lifelong role in combating racial injustice. She's really devoted her life to this cause. As a teen in the 1960s, in Selma, Alabama, she participated in the civil rights movement, integrating her high school, participating in marches and meetings, and working with renowned leaders such as John Lewis and Martin Luther King Jr. She later earned her JD from VLS in 1986, and she re returned as an associate director of alumni affairs and an admissions counselor in 1999. In 2001, she was appointed as the associate dean for student affairs, and she has since been a tireless advocate for law students and lawyers of color, earning the Legal Education Access and Diversity Champion Award from the National Black Pre-Law Conference in 2019. She knew that it was imperative for Vermont Law School to respond to this crisis and respond it has. We've experienced um, a series of lectures about one per month in the two years um, since 2020 that have covered all manner of different topics um, from uh, policing, embedded racism in um, education, also in um, various areas of the law. Um, so tonight's panel of speakers are appearing in response to a uh, student request to Dean Jefferson for a panel that discussed the topic of indigenous boarding schools and compulsory schools for indigenous students. I sent a message out to my national listserv of faculty who teach um, in the area of indigenous peoples and the law and I received several responses. And the response that led me to these speakers was the most interesting of the responses that I got. So um, I reached out to them and thankfully they agreed to join us tonight to present their interdisciplinary research on the topic of indigenous boarding schools and on one particular boarding school in Utah. So I'd like to now introduce our speakers. Dr. Freena King, a citizen of Navajo Nation, is Associate Professor of History and Affiliated Faculty of Cherokee and Indigenous Studies at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah, homelands of the Cherokee Nation and United Katua Band of Cherokees. She's also the director and founder of the NSU Center for Indigenous Community Engagement. Dr. King specializes in 20th century Native American studies, especially American Indian boarding school histories. She's the author of several books, including The Earth Memory Compass, Diné Landscapes, and Education in the 20th Century. And she's the co-author with her fellow panelists tonight of the book Returning Home, Diné Creative Works from the Intermountain Indian School. She's currently working on a project about Diné healers over generations to contextualize the lived experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic in Navajo, Navajo country, excuse me. <coughs> Dr. Michael Taylor is Assistant Professor of English and Associate Director of American Indian Studies at Brigham Young University. He's the current Butler Young Scholar with the Charles Redd Center for Western Studies. His scholarship on indigenous activism, poetry, and boarding schools has appeared in such journals as American Quarterly, Native American and Indigenous Studies, and Modernism, Modernity. His research engages indigenous archives to expand the literacy histories, literary histories, and ongoing resurgent acts of indigenous communities. Dr. James Swenson is associate professor of art history and the history of photography at Brigham Young University. His research interests include documentary photography, American photography, and the visual representation of the American West. He is the author of several articles and two monographs picturing migrants, the Grapes of Wrath and New Deal Documentary Photography and In a Rugged Land, Ansel Adams, Dorothea Lange, and the Three Mormon Towns Collaboration from 1953 to 1954. So the format of tonight's event, just to give you an idea of what to expect, will include a presentation by our speakers and the audience will have the opportunity to submit questions um, on the Vermont Law School Facebook page and also on the website. So feel free to post your questions even while the speakers are presenting and 
I will be able to read those questions to the panelists at the end of, um, of their, their prepared presentation and remarks. I will relay those questions to them and then facilitate the question and answer session at the end. So welcome Drs. King, Taylor, and Swenson. Yat e CEO. I'm chiming in as, as um, Hillary mentioned from uh, Jalagi country and as is said, Indian territory historically, but indigenous homelands of 39 federally recognized tribal nations that were forcibly removed, but others such as um, Kado, Osage, uh, Kwapa, who um, have been a part of these spaces that is now known as the state of Oklahoma since time immemorial. And actually it's um, been a lot for me to reflect on how the Neh were almost forcibly removed to Indian territory as well. And we were, our ancestors, my ancestors um, were removed to Awelte, um, Fort Sumner, the land of the suffering and a concentration camp um, in the mid to late 19th century. Um, I appreciate the invitation to speak to you all wherever you are and acknowledge, you know, that everywhere is indigenous land. There's a story of homelands. And I was fortunate to live some time and be a guest in the lands of the Abenaki or uh, Abenaki as, as commonly known there in the Vermont area and lived in White River Junction, was a fellow at Dartmouth as mentioned and was able to actually visit the Vermont Law School with an incredible um, event there featuring Paiute struggles for water. So I'm excited to join you again, um, though not in person this time, um, but acknowledge and more than acknowledge hope that we all realize acknowledgement is beyond words. It's remembering its action and that Abeniki have called the waters and lands of Vermont um, in the Kina homeland, you know, since time immemorial and not a wilderness or virgin soil to be taken over. So I, I like to say that and that I've also been in Utah a lot where Mike and, and James are joining us um, today and, and where the school that we're talking about um, was placed and homelands of Ute and Shoshone peoples that I am honored to have made, made friends with and, and have family who live in, in their ancestral homelands. Um, and all the, and Dene as well, who are a part of what's considered the state of Utah. And my parents um, lived for about a decade or so in a Sabian Disguy Monument Valley, a community that we'll talk about um, today. So I'm, saying that classic phrase that on your go or whatever you're saying is I'm sharing my screen, everyone. And can you hear me and see this? All right, Hillary's nodding, good. Um, so this is that, you know, the overview is going to each talk about different components of this work. I know you invited us to talk about a lot of the issues of injustice and, uh, racial inequities and all these kind of dynamics um, with boarding schools. And I think this project is, is one very important and a part of that conversation. Um, and we each will talk about that, Mike, James, and I, but I, I first have to introduce myself and, and also acknowledge I, I do not speak for all the people who have worked with us, though I try to always, you know, recognize them and know that we are speaking after so much experience and support from so many people, so many voices and contributions to this work of sharing boarding school stories. And one of the Intermountain Indian boarding school in particular, and it's not really one story, right? The, the multiple um, interweavings, a, a tapestry of stories with all these different threads. Um, but Intermountain Indian School, as we we'll mentioned, was technically known as the largest federal Indian boarding school in American history. So it is of particular interest and a very complicated story as, as all these Indian federal boarding schools are. But as you see here, um, 
we cannot continue without the respect and honor of especially our elders, the Ne and uh, inner tribal alumni of the Inner Mountains Indian School alumni, um, different associations who still are vibrant after all they've been through is remarkable. And we'll be talking about um, their part in, in this work and Navajo Nation Museum, different um, cultural centers and institutions that supported us, our universities with different grants and um, academic centers like the Charles Red Center for Western Studies, Utah Humanities, uh, Diné chapter, local government communities, um, Navajo Nation Historic Preservation Department. Those are even just a few. There's so many other people we are so grateful to, and of course, to each other and to our families. So we are honored you know, to be here and share this story with you. All right. Um, since this is being live streamed, unfortunately, I, I usually like to show a few of oral histories as I worked with oral histories primarily. Um, but because it's live streamed, I am going to have to forego that <laughs> due to just, you know, making sure um, the right permissions are set and everything, but we can refer to the different themes. But um, these are images of a few of the Intermountain Indian School alumni who were very important in sharing their voice, sharing their stories and, and memories of the school and us working with them and being inspired and, and solicited, like requested to develop this book, Returning Home, that we co-authored and worked on together. But really, you know, the true authors of this book are the Intermountain students themselves. It, it sustains their voices at a particular moment, but tries to contextualize it, you know, as the book came out just November, 2021, and still more stories, you know, this is not a closed book, right? There's so many more stories that are important for us to continue to share and tell. So that was um, Rena, <clears throat> sorry, going back, Rena Dixon and um, others like her who talked with us, Ben Nez here too, uh, shared their stories through the oral histories that I primarily worked with as an oral historian and Diné scholar. And for me, my positionality, you know, the three of us being very clear of where we're coming from, why we're doing this work, um, it, it's always very relationship-based in how we position ourselves. And for me, um, these are eh, kinship stories because um, my father went to boarding school. Uh, he was dropped off when he was five years old. And this is a picture of Shige, uh, Phil Smith, Do Shinali Atza, my paternal grandmother, Johanna Haskautsi. And uh, as I was saying in, in the Nebazad, we introduce ourselves by our clans. So I would say, She'e Bilagana Nishle, Do Kiaani, Bashishchin, Bilagana, Da Shuche. And that's how I explain that I call out to my relatives and say that I am through my mother, we acknowledge our maternal lines, our mothers, um, that I am of white English American settler descent through my mother and born for the towering house clan and Black Street Woods people of my father and, and as mentioned before, a citizen of Navajo Nation, but Diné through those kinship ties. And this is an image of me in the cradle board and I was, I was born and where my umbilical cords are buried, that's a traditional way we ask, where are you from? Because there's that ongoing connection of place, family, community is uh, so important to Diné, you know, who were a main focus in these boarding school stories and in many of my studies, because I've been, tracing my own family stories and, and connection. And as um, Anishinaabe scholar Brenda Child has said, uh, boarding schools really become a metaphor of colonialism, you know, of, of what it stands for in these different aspects. So as mentioned, I did a project called the Earth Memory Compass, and that traced on reservation boarding school experiences in the Nebukeya, Navajo homelands, because people think boarding schools are so far away and, and that children are sent far away, but some were right in Navajo Nation within our four sacred mountains, our ancestral homelands. 
And yet those walls were still very thick and the assimilationist agenda and genocide, the effort to wipe out a people, to wipe out their existence and using boarding schools as a tactic for that. And there are scholars, uh, good friends of mine, Preston McBride, who are actually tracing the physical violence and death that happens at these schools, as well as Marsha Small, a Northern Cheyenne scholar who's going to Chamawa Indian Boarding School and using a GPS um, or ground, penetra ground penetrating radar to find unmarked graves, as you're hearing about in different media. So folks knew I was working on this project, specifically my, my friends here, uh, Dr. Michael Taylor, he first reached out to me since he had some students who came across the Utah State University collections that they had in archives since the Intermountain Boarding School closed. And he knew of a student who was interested in working with these creative writings. And um, later we learned it wasn't only creative writings that were in an archival collection that the Utah State University held. And um, excuse me earlier, they're another important partner that we have to, and we definitely do emphasize throughout our conversation today. Um, so he reached out to me and said, Farina, you know, I know you know, um, you've emphasized a lot of the Ne boarding school experience. Have you heard about Intermountain? You know, different people came up to me about Intermountain and he asked about this collection that a student, um, Terrence Ride, who also contributed to the book, Returning Home, um, his part in supporting this work. We had many students work with us. So thank you so much um, to them as well. And then I said, hey, I have an idea. I knew about the Utah State uh, university collection, but the question of accessibility has really bothered me. Um, when I did my project on Earth Memory Compass, I had to travel far to these archives. And even if many of them are digitized, like what Utah State has done an incredible job doing, as we know in COVID-19 really exposing and, and other areas, internet is not equal everywhere. You know, the accessibility is still not um, the same everywhere. So we had this idea of creating a interdisciplinary traveling exhibit of making sure we bring and curate these students own works back home, like to their home in Dene Bikeya. And then what grew from that was, as I mentioned, an oral history project of talking with students, working with alumni. And that's where they encouraged us, please, will you write a book so we can have something for our family and our community? And that's how it came together. Now, I try to give just a little basic background because I'll you know, be passing the baton on to Mike and James to share you know, different components here. So this part is a little more of the background because we don't know how familiar everyone is with Dene Bikeya and Navajo Nation. Um, so this is a map to kind of help place you. It's around the Four Corners area, about 20, 27,000 square miles. It's a size of, comparable to the country of Ireland, the state of West Virginia. So this is a big space and a, a nation. Um, and the four mountains are point, uh, pointed out here. Those are our sacred and ancestral boundaries, in a sense, the markers of where the Nebuchadnezzar is. But the um, outline part is where reservation borders to treaties like the Treaty of 1868 um, set after removal. Navajo is able to have the Treaty of 1868 to return from the concentration camp of Ahuete. So why in our mountain? You know, a little background of why is this school so important um, and what can we learn from it? And, and of course, emphasizing the stories of the students uh, is that it opened about 1950. And at that moment, Navajo Nation was in a crisis People think after World War II, yay, America's on top of the world, a big boom. There's that kind of memory of it. But for Navajo Nation, they were in desperation and families were starving. And um, President Harry Truman had to declare a state of emergency in Navajo Nation, drought, um, real struggle of the people finding employment and just even being able to sustain themselves. So the Navajo Nation government forming at that time with leaders such as Sam Akea, 
are pleading, as this news article from 1974 shows, asking for help. And they see education also as a solution of addressing this desperation is a changed attitude in, in how Navajos view possibly education as a strategy of survival, but what kind of compromises happen in all that when they work with the United States government after World War II to pass what is called Navajo emergency education programs. And they say, okay, you know, they realize that, and I'm speaking of like American government officials and also Navajo tribal leaders um, in the kind of conversations they're having, they're realizing over 50% of Diné school age children are not going to any form of school, of schooling, and don't even have access to it, even if they wanted to sign up. And of course, there was a lot of suspicion and reluctance, more than that, you know, aversion and resistance to schooling systems for very good reasons, right? The kind of assimilation and violence. We also hear about um, schools that have become notorious, such as the Carlisle Industrial School, the first federal Indian boarding school opened by Richard Henry Pratt under the banner of kill the Indian in them, save the man. So Diné were aware of those dynamics, but after World War II, it was a very, you know, a different context, right? A different world. And so this, as this uh, kind of propaganda portrays, education is the future, you know, send your child to these schools away and they can save Navajo Nation, right? That's how they viewed it. And just to give you a sense of uh, where this school, particularly Inner Mountain was set was Brigham City. And at one of the most, um, closer points of Navajo Nation to Brigham City is still, you know, about almost towards 500 miles away, right? So it still is, this was an off-reservation boarding school very far. So um, I know I'm, I got to wrap up to pass on. There's so much fact in here that I hope you get a chance to read the book, but this is the kind of student works that we came across in the archives and not only in the archives, but the archives spurred us to reach out and work with alumni and find student works, creative works and expressions like this one um, uh, image by a Robert Curley, a, an Intermountain student um, at, since it opened in 1950 and before it closed in 1984. But um, this school opened in response to the United States government working with um, Navajo Nation to, to have this emergency education. And there were state senators, specifically um, Arthur Watkins, who was a terminationist trying to terminate tribes who saw the benefit of this kind of um, collaboration, if you will, that he decided a boarding school would be great to pipeline. They thought these boarding schools would be a way to expedite termination, that Navajos had to be ready for it and prepared through schools like Intermountain to be civilized still, though they might use another word like assimilated, integrated. And so this image, you know, is a student who's really thinking about, you know, all these pushes through the relocation programs, go to the city, um, you know, leave Navajo country behind, fit in, be an American citizen, you know, what they're facing as they're experiencing it. And that Navajos are called a Navajo problem at this time and all, all these kind of um, dynamics. So I will pass now to Mike to talk about, you know, what were some of the works that we featured and the voices that we were highlighting from how Navajo students are experiencing these dynamics. Thanks, Farina. And it looks like I'm not able to share my screen. So Parker, if you could give me access to share my screen as well, that'd be great. Do you want um, me to do it or you want me to just stop? I'll sharing? go ahead and do it, Farina, if you want to stop sharing. Okay. There you go. So thank you, Farina. Thanks, Hillary, as well, for welcoming us and for all of those who are joining us today. Um, I'm currently situated here in Utah. And like Farina said, Utah's home to eight federally recognized tribes. Um, the BYU, where I teach and where James is as well, um, is on the ancestral homelands. The, the Northern Ute. 
as well as the Paiute and Shoshone peoples. Um, I really appreciated the way that Freena laid out our project and I'm excited to speak or have the chance to talk with you all. I'll try to keep my part short because I'd love to hear your questions, but um, often when we do these types of talks, I mean, I'm in the literature, um, James is the art, Freena is in a history department. We don't often do talks in front of law students and law professors, but what we're doing is, is deeply integrated into the legal realities of indigenous peoples. Um, and so I like the way that Farina pointed out that language and kinship and homelands and the things that, that we use to organize this larger work are not just kind of cultural signifiers, but they're legal claims. And so that's something that we can also work through together as we get um, time to discuss. But as Farina pointed out, we, we broke the book into a, um, kind of three main categories and we each took on one aspect of it. So Farina did a lot of the historical contextual work and the oral histories, um, a lot of the community-based outreach. Um, I worked specifically on curating and recovering the writings, the creative writings of students. And then James, as he'll speak here in just a moment, worked specifically on the art and the photography. And I wanted to start with this idea, let's see if we can get this working, that the language we use to document and to represent indigenous peoples, as all of you know, also informs our legal practice, um, informs our legislature, informs public opinion that allows for certain legislature. Um, and so before coming to this, before coming to this project, we came in with a, I, I would say James and I especially came in with a certain idea of what boarding schools were. Um, Farina was much more experienced than we were with, with ancestral um, connections to boarding schools and also just through her studies. But we came in with this kind of institutional knowledge and assumption. And I want to just go ahead and read one bit of how boarding school poetry or boarding school writings has been represented until the work that we've been doing. And this comes, and this is not necessary to, to critique Robert Dale Parker, who's an excellent scholar, and this book is a fantastic resource to anyone who does indigenous literature. But he, he put together this whole book of poems that are recovered poetry prior to 1930, um, which obviously the boarding school era is running through this era. And he said this about excluding much of the poetry written in boarding schools. He said, as a group, the larger set of school poems lean toward bland cliches about how wonderful school is, along with the usual trite pieties about classmates and graduation. And yet the poignant position of the students and a recognition that they wrote and published under the watchful eyes of sometimes dedicated but still colonialist overlords cannot help lending even the school bound platitudes an extra interest. So this is kind of what I went in thinking I would find when I started to look through the, the boarding school era poetry. Um, what, we, what we ended up finding was something much more than just school bound platitudes that are contextually interesting. We found students, young um, Dene students who, like Farina pointed out, use the arts, whether that's through creative writing or, or visual art, to make legal claims, whether they were intentionally making legal claims or not, likely not, but they're making legal claims to homelands, to ancestors, to creation stories that tie them to specific places and specific legal and political identities. And so um, just to share a couple of quick examples of, of the type of work, this is what a lot of the poetry looks like embedded alongside artwork that is all produced by students. And these journals actually that were published at the school um, were published directly through the students. And I wanna show just two quick examples of some of the students who are featured in the book. The first one is a little more playful because I think a lot of what happens when we talk about boarding schools is we focus on, on the important reality of, of cultural genocide. Um, and in that focus, 
we, sh we shift away sometimes from the realities of indigenous youth being indigenous youth in these spaces. Um, and so this first one is just kind of a funny one that I love to share, but it's from Archie Washburn, who Farina had the chance to interview. We met him at a, at a reunion camp out that these alumni still hold each year. And his response was that one of these days, my people, my children will know that I am a poet. Um, and he, he was one of a few who wrote full collections of poems and published full individual collections of poetry as a student. Um, so this one again gives us an insight just into the day-to-day -day realities of what it means to experience adolescence away from home in this kind of culturally limiting space. So Archie writes, I was young, now I am older, and now I play it cool. Around me is school, some friends are a fool, others we play it cool. We go out with cool cats. Man, you're nowhere when you play it cool. We dig chicks that are boss. Nobody plays it rough. Nobody acts tough. We play it cool, man. We go out for balls, have a short chop. Everything's cool, baby, when you're playing it cool. I share this again because I think it highlights this oversight that often happens when we talk about the legality of boarding schools, the, like I said, the cultural genocide of boarding schools, ongoing investigations, this is not to dumb down the, those harsh, like I said, genocidal realities. It's to help us humanize those who are actually suffering at the hands of what Robert Dale Parker calls colonialist overlords. Um, I'm gonna jump over to the, the next student really quickly, whose name is Henry Tinhorn. Um, because Henry Tinhorn, his poetry takes on a much more kind of direct, introspective, serious tone about the experiences of boarding school. Henry Tinhorn died at the age of 20. Um, he, he went directly to Vietnam. A lot of boarding schools, as many of you know, were kind of factories to, to develop soldiers to go into to war. Um, the Intermountain Indian School actually was built out of an old military hospital. And again, that was, that was not uncommon that boarding schools were kind of the direct or were built on the foundation of, of earlier military spaces. But Henry Tinhorn, um, let me jump over to his preface because I think it gives us a really good insight into what students were hoping to do by turning to the arts to express their cultural and legal identities. He writes, for ages, people had the assumption that the power of the pen could save mankind, but I think the future lies with the young. The elders of the time choose to remain blind to this. Nevertheless, my life is bound in here, and the fears, joys, knowledge, and stupidity of myself screams from the seams of this book. The poems in here were not meant to get anyone uptight. I invite you to share with me and hopefully enjoy. All I ask is remember me not by my actions, but remember me by my poems. And I'm gonna to jump to one of his poems really quickly, um, this poem entitled Learning, in which he writes, in days gone by and in night's starry skies, I was a child of happiness who scorned the bitterness. Ripe were my, my dreams, contented in tattered jeans, when life had no meaning to a face always beaming, until the silences of the violets opened my eyes. Two words and a mouth was all it took, dirty engine, I sighed, wept, wailed, knowing brotherhood was forgotten. So Henry Tinhorn was 17 years old when he wrote this. Um, as I'll show here in just a second, um, through some, some really fortuitous kind of connections that were made throughout this process, we were able to meet his surviving siblings um, and share his poetry back with them. And most of them had never seen any of it before because he was only home during the summers. He was always gone to boarding school since a very young age. Um, but what this is pointing to, again, is also a recognition that in these spaces, especially these later years of boarding schools, like Farina was talking about, I mean, this school is running through the civil rights era. American Indian movement activists are showing up on campus, like recruiting young students. So one of the things we also forget to recognize or reimagine when we talk about boarding schools is how they unintentionally created networks of activists and networks of, of young indigenous peoples who built re relationships across tribal nations um, and led to many of the first 
um, lawyers, doctors, politicians, etc., who then pushed for and reclaimed um, tribal rights throughout the early 20th century, and then all the way into, like I said, here with in with the Intermountain Indian School, into the late 20th century. Um, so here's what I was talking about, this great example of how Farina was suggesting that what we were trying to do is make this accessible, not just accessible, but also get it back into the hands of, of those whose creativity was originally displaced from their communities, communal spaces. Um, and so this is two of Henry Tinhorn's sisters along with his niece and great niece um, who came to one of our events and read his poetry. Um, so they did a, 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 a reading of their um, deceased brother, uncle, et cetera, um, creative work. And as we talk together, we realize that a lot of this work, whether it's the legal work that we're doing, whether it's this literary re like recovery, the oral histories, the, the goal of this work is this communal resurgence and this communal healing that happens when we gather in these spaces um, and, and work through, grapple through the, the hard intersections of law and politics and art and identity. So with that, let's turn it over to you, James. Okay, thank you, Mike. As Mike mentioned, I um, was brought on board uh, because I've done, I, I work with art. But before I start, I would like to thank those who made this possible. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is a little huskier than normal. I'm not sure why. But I'd like to thank those who made this possible. And I applaud uh, Dean Jefferson and all those who put together this forum. It's certainly the right time for it. Um, I'd also like to thank my colleagues for their remarks. And it's been a privilege to be um, able to work with them and to be able to move this work forward. Um, I'm the oldest member of this group, and I'm the only one that actually remembers seeing Intermountain. Um, as a young boy, I, I grew up in Salt Lake City, and we were traveling north up to Logan, which is the northern part of Utah. And um, I remember seeing Intermountain. I remember seeing, it was the dead of winter, and I remember seeing students as they, uh, out in, well, this is what the, the facility looked like. I remember seeing them walking around the streets and asking my parents what this was and, and being told that this was an Indian boarding school. And at the time, I didn't understand what that meant, but I'm grateful for this project in that it is, as Mike said, has helped open my eyes to what these schools are, what they were, um, what they, how they're able to help students uh, at the same time, the challenges that these students um, had while they were studying far from home. Um, as Frida mentioned, I uh, was brought on board in, in um, to help think about the art, think about the visual creations of the students. And it became pretty clear early on that one of the things we wanted to do was to gather as much of this material as we could find, which on the surface I thought would be easy. I've curated exhibitions several times in my career, um, but I was, um, surprised in how difficult it was to find good work, um, actually find any work. And so we did all sorts of things. We asked around, we um, talked to collectors. I took out an ad in local newspapers and eventually we were able to come together, bring a number of works together, which we felt was strongly um, shows the talent and the ability of these young students. And one of the best parts of this project is that we were able to return this work home. Um, as been mentioned, that was a part of the impetus of what we wanted to do, is not only to gather this work, but to be able to get it into the hands of those who um, either were at, at Intermountain or the family members of the alumni um, whose family spent time there. So, um, the exhibition actually just ended last month and it went to five different locations throughout the Intermountain West. And it was really a great um, treat just to hear how, um, how many people came and saw the exhibition and how it um, was able to get back to those to whom it tr truly belonged. And, and this obviously will keep going even though the exhibition itself is now over. But one of the things that also excited me, I'm an art historian as was mentioned, and um, one of the things that initially really excited me about this project, um, even before we started finding the work of the students, was the fact that Alan Hauser, the great Apache artist and sculptor, um, was the first 
teacher at Intermountain. Um, he was brought up uh, by the first director and taught at Intermountain for 10 years. And Alan Hauser is um, not just one of the most important Native American artists of the 20th century, but it was one of the most important artists of the 20th century, known today primarily for his sculpture. But Hauser did, was one of those truly important artists and teachers of his generation. And he spent, as I said, 10 years, beginning in 1951, teaching at Intermountain Moon School. Um, and while he was there, he was able to um, train many students. And one of those that came to our attention was a young student who was born just outside of Window Rock in Arizona by the name of Robert Chi. Um, just like Mike talked about Henry Tinhorn as, as one of these um, young artists who kind of came to the fore and really impressed us, Robert Chi was that for me. He was the only student listed as being an artist, whereas his peers were listed in the yearbook as you know, studying auto mechanics or house painting. Um, Robert Chi was listed as an artist. And one of the things I like about Chi is that he was able to capture this, the idea, again, taught by Hauser, but be able to channel this, this desire to return home and to paint his people. Unfortunately, his, his life and career was cut short, but even at the time of his death, he was working on series that looked at Navajo land and looked at returning. And so this is just one example of what Robert Chi, um, one of the works that he was able to produce, which has, we've used as the cover for our book, as well as for our advertisements, an image that truly resonates with us. But there were a number of these artists and uh, the young student artists. And even after how Alan Hauser left, um, others were trained and it became obvious that there were many um, of these young students who had real talents. Um, in 1969, uh, a young teacher by the name of Jim Westergaard came to Intermountain and taught students there how to make lino cuts in which you basically take a linoleum panel and you carve into it and then run it through an intaglio process. And um, Jim told me just how impressed he was at the talent of these young students who, with just a minimal amount of training, were not able, not only able to create complex works like the previous one I showed you, but were also able to capture the things for which they pined, the things of home, um, as you can see in this work by Alice Benelli. Um, the other thing that also began early on was the painting of murals. And Alan Hauser um, was a well-known muralist who had been trained as a muralist and painted on the walls of Inner Mountain. Unfortunately, those murals are gone, but Hauser taught his students how to paint murals. And over the course of the 34 year history of Inner Mountain, the walls and almost every surface of Inner Mountain Indian School was painted, in, painted by students after generation and generation of students. Most of these unfortunately have perished along with the buildings, but some like this example here, that is a, a surviving door panel, um, probably by an artist I really came to like that named Rex Walter, um, shows these young human beings, these young um, individuals, these young Navajo caught between these two worlds. And Farina mentioned this, and a perfect example of that is the work by Robert Curley, um, who we saw previously. But uh, not only did they paint on the walls, but they were encouraged to submit drawings. They were encouraged to uh, create the covers for their various in-house publications, like this one, Smoke Signals. And again, um, through their work and encouragement uh, from not just artists, but others uh, and teachers, they were able to tell us what life was like for them. Um, again, this school is a liminal state for all of us, but especially for these young, these young Navajo students who are pulled away from family. And being pushed in one direction or another. I think Curly captures that as well as any um, in this work. But being young and as, as Mike said, living in really exciting times, um, they were affected by the things that were going on around them. Um, they were, um, they loved watching TV. They loved listening to the radio. They were, they were impacted by the various movements and ideas that were circulating around them. And, that shows up in some of the drawings, like this one by uh, an artist by the name of Rocco, um, who submitted a number of pieces for the publication. But what I really like about these young students and artists 
is that sometimes they provided work that doesn't make sense. Like this one, another example from Rocco, um, which is one of my favorites. And Farina just sent me this as a t-shirt. So thank you, Farina. I should have been wearing that today in honor of, of the Rocco's untitled dead frog. But again, I, I don't know the deeper symbolism of this particular work. I don't know if it has deeper symbolism other than again, these young students and artists were responding to the world around them. And yes, they could take the form of silly drawings that were submitted to uh, poetry publications, but they often painted um, and filled entire walls. One of the best um, parts of this whole process for me was taking this massive lance, this massive mural that was painted for Intermountain by a young artist by the name of T.H. White. Um, just to give you a sense of scale here, this is about 15 feet wide and about three and a half to four feet high. It is backed by masonite. And I will promise you, and I can attest that this thing weighs a thousand pounds. I've hauled this thing in U-Hauls from one place to the next. And um, probably the highlight, as I said, of this whole process for me was being able to take this mural and be able to show it at the Navajo Museum in Window Rock, to put it up and have it fill an entire wall and to be the backdrop and the focal point of, of not just Dine, not just um, Navajo visitors, but anyone who came into the building could realize and see um, the talent and the ambition of these young, of these young people. Um, I should also just put in a, a plug too. In 1974, Intermountain went intertribal. Um, before it had focused mostly on um, Navajo, in fact, exclusively on, on, on Navajo. But in 1974, it opened up to uh, tribes from all across the United States, and um, including, and, and, and several young students, uh, again, came from all over, from east to west. Um, one of those was Zig Jackson, and another great part of this project for me was being able to talk to Zig, who went on to become the first um, Native American to receive his MFA in photography, and studied at prestigious schools, and has continued to explore um, what it means to be a Native American, what it means to be Mandan and Hidatsa and Hidera, right? Um, and all of these things um, that he explores in his work. And yet when I asked Zig about his time in Intermountain, yes, he acknowledged that there were trials and troubles but at the same time, the experiences they had there, he said, opened up what it meant to be Native American, what it meant to be Indian. And um, that was a nice part of, of being able to learn that firsthand from um, one of these young artists. And in the end, I, I'll just conclude with this image. Um, the buildings, most of the buildings were torn down. It took several years for that to happen. And in the meantime, um, personal objects, personal items, parts in, in, of, of lives were left in the mountain, such as these four abandoned photographs. But they, again, indicate and show us how, yes, these individuals um, were removed from their families um, and all these things, but at the same time are also young individuals trying to figure out who they are um, in right, um, far, far, far away from home. So with that, I will in this yeah i'll um share some concluding remarks of our time before we open up to hearing questions and having a conversation from everyone too and i want to acknowledge um you know hearing mike and james talk to there's so many people you could hear there or see in the labels like brad peterson was um mentioned in a caption of, of those images because there were individuals just passerby, um, you know, people passing by who would stop into the grounds before um, the buildings were mostly bulldozed. There's a few intact um, parts of the school, but very few. And um, for a while, it was left vacant and vandalized and um, fenced up. But there are even some people who were trespassers who went in and took a lot of photos of the walls. And there's ongoing projects and different people um, working with oral history or with uh, these areas of the arts and creative works too. And Brad Peterson was an individual, again, just would drive by or whatever. And he learned about the art pieces that were in a very um, endangered situation. 
vulnerable situation and, and he helped to salvage a good number of them. So we have, you know, those individuals to thank who just did it. You know, he didn't have family who went there. Um, he, he just knew this was uh, powerful and something to do. Um, so I want to show a few images too, as we wrap up here and let me get it back into the present mode. Oh, I thought I had it where I wanted it, but I think it, all right, this is where I want it. Um, I think what's been implied as well in this work, and I, I think I'm un, unmuted, right? Okay, good. <laughs> um, is there's a lot of different narratives and stories of federal Indian boarding schools. And in no way, you know, are we justifying or legitimizing violence that happens and, and these structures that are designed to control, repress, hurt a people. And that's where, you know, being honest of recognizing the roots of those kinds of designs is so crucial and important in whatever work. But then what happens on the ground? What is the lived experience? Including what are the unspoken quiet stories? Of course, people who have more, you know, what people will consider positive or even nostalgic memories um, at these institutions that were designed to, from their, you know, planners, they were designed to eradicate Indianness or at least create a kosher, sanitized sense of what it meant to be Native American and certainly to eradicate indigenous sovereignty, as Mike was mentioning in, in terms of uh, legal terms and dynamics, right? They were designed for that. So you know, this is an image that it's tip of the iceberg. There's so many other stories, riots, violence, terrible things that happen at Inner Mountain that we continue to learn and need to still recognize and hear. But also it's important to recognize the intricacies of people's lives and lived experiences. And um, this picture here is of a dear friend. He is Shajee Yaje. You know, he's like an uncle to me, Jesse Holiday from Sebi and this guy. Uh, Monument Valley with his father. And from a young age, uh, his family sent him to boarding school. He tells me they were threatened with incarceration if they didn't send him to school. And he told me how at school, that's where he was introduced, though, to watercolor, um, painting, and certain arts that he said pulled him out while it was very devastating, very traumatic for him. Um, it's like the art was a lifeline. And it's through his art, he was able to express these beauties of home. I'm just really moved because um, I really love this man. He's an incredible person, has been through a lot. And we are very fortunate to work with him and to feature his work and that he shared his story with us. And not only that, but we had so many community activities and events like visiting the Sebi in the Sky Elementary School with students from our respective universities and sharing the story with them. You know, it's also that we're sharing with you where I just recently went to Window Rock High School and shared with the Dene youth there, I'm sharing with everyone as much as I can. And we are very fortunate that Jesse could come with us to the Dene Elementary School and share his story. And the children saw him and said, Che, and they recognized you know, his work and what he had been through. And they were able to draw you know, the beauties of their land and, and acknowledge that around them when they have, all a lot to face with many different kinds of struggles. So like I said, and James and Mike also referred to, was we are very fortunate to do the best we could, have a lot of support, 
to take this exhibit, especially to Diné communities. And we did focus on primarily the earlier years of the boarding school. And that reminds us, and we have been reminded by Intermountain um, Intertribal alumni, there's more. There's so many more stories and much work to continue to do. Um, and in some cases, you know, we could only go and bring these panels because we couldn't lug a thousand pounds of the art, you know, to these different chapter communities that are really spread out. But Try, there's more effort to do that, you know, and, and where is the support with that? You know, that, that's the other question. As we went to Navajo Nation Museum and these different places, um, this is a picture of our, our main team here um, and that we're trying to still support the best we can because I know a question that was brought up when I was invited to join you all today was questions of reparations, I'm sure some of you are wondering about uh, the Department of Interior and Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland, Laguna Pueblo herself, um, and the Federal Indian Boarding School Truth Initiative that we're waiting for that report. And folks have contacted me, um, including you know Navajo Nation that the department has reached out to of what do they know about boarding schools? What, you know, just trying to find out even the United States confronting this history that so few people know about or understand the complexities and intricacies and, and especially the intergenerational trauma and hurt and detriment that happened from these schools, but how it's really messy because these are people's lives too. It was their childhood This for the survivors, you know, as, as more folks are being known. And I will say that too, because I'm a descendant of boarding school survivors, and my dad almost died trying to escape running away from the, a boarding school and miraculously was found by a rancher in a snowstorm. So it really hit me in, in these recent months when people were talking about unmarked graves that that could have been my father and I wouldn't exist if he didn't survive. And why did he have to face that? You know, why did his parents? feel that they had that pressure, you know, to drop him off. Um, so these are very difficult questions, but something I want to always remind people and what you see in image here is healing is very collective. We think a lot of it as individual, you know, the, on that personal level, maybe health is that new year's resolution, lose your fat or whatever. But in, in a lot of these instances, I, it's really hit me, like impressed upon me of how collective healing is too. And what Mike and James witnessed and I did too in gathering with Intermountain alumni is they could even laugh about very painful memories and the healing of the humor or just speaking all in Navajo with each other in Navajo country at these reunions. But they had to pay out of their own pocket, you know, to gather and to even have a space. And they also, you know, the image that you saw in the background here was the eye that was inscripted on a side of a mountain in Brigham City. And the paint has been wearing off. And intertribal alumni and Diné alumni, they gather still as much as they can. And recently, last year, they gathered and they were like billy goats climbing that side of the mountain. And I wouldn't even do that, but they did to repaint that eye because they want people to remember. And they had to save up and they still do when they're tight on funds and face so much because that's their healing. So I hope, you know, it's not just like cutting a check for an individual person, but really supporting the community. And I'll say this because I created this GoFundMe because we're looking even just for support of how to support these boarding school survivors who are still with us, not even to mention, you know, um, the children the descendants, because I recently, just yesterday, talked to a Choctaw woman 
who told me how she signed up for the military and she realized it had a lot to do with the boarding school stories she heard that she wanted to, she wanted that, like all kinds of things. She also told me she knew of a indigenous community where the elders still have hiding spots for children because of that trauma impressed on them. So I, I want to tell you all, thank you for listening. I look forward to talking to you and with Mike and James and thank them for all, you know, that they've contributed, all they've done, this work that we do. But there's still a lot of work to be done. Even Utah State, they formed, you know, a community of, of what to do now with these murals that some were sitting in a warehouse. So there are still a lot of open questions and work to do, but I'm grateful step-by-step step that we walk in beauty, restore balance as Dene teach, Sanagai um, Hajo. It is live a long life in beauty, but it has that sense of journey and Hajo is not superficial beauty. It's, it's really harmony, balance, and life will be thrown into chaos. It will have disorder, but we, that healing and constant cycle of it is what, what we face. So thank you all. And we look forward to hearing your questions and doing the best we can to um, address your questions and comments. Thank you all so much. That was amazing. Um, I've been, the questions have been sort of flooding in through different channels and I just wanted to read the first comments that have come in. So um, we received comments on the Facebook page saying that this is really moving and informative and this is so important and thank you all for the work that you're doing. Um, as far as the questions, they're kind of a, a mishmash. So I, I think I'll just read them in the order in which they came in. So. The first question is about um, any um, evidence of censorship that you found in your research. So like, I think that question is asking about like the influence of the teachers or like messaging from the teachers maybe. I think that's what the question is geared towards. I can speak to this one um, because the, I mean, creative writing gives more space often to um, work your way around censorship <laughs> than maybe a, 16 foot mural might. Um, but Freen and I also had the chance to speak with the, um, the teacher that actually developed the creative writing program in, um, at the very beginning. Her, um, her name's Alexa West and, and she, was, she was great at kind of helping us understand what was at stake um, and what assumptions there were. So when she first proposed this idea to do creative writing as a way for students to kind of express their own thoughts and identities. The administrators, the, I'll quote the response was, Indian kids can't write sonnets. This idea that they just wouldn't be able to write poetry or they wouldn't be able to write creative, good creative work. Um, but she was able to still push through and get this creative writing program. And when I asked her this very question about censorship, because this is something that we're that we see in a lot of boarding school spaces or just other um, assimilationist type of spaces. She said, as long as they didn't write explicitly about sex and drugs, they usually were able to get everything out. Um, but we still found um, a, a variety of, of subtle and, and sometimes overt depictions of sexuality or of drug use, um, alcohol use. Um, teenagers being teenagers away from home. <laughs> so I, I would add that censorship was present, but not um, like in a different way. Like there was, there was a boarding school culture of censorship and control, right? So there were expectations of how to have a level of conformity. And if you conformed, and worked within those certain boundaries, you could get by. And maybe as Mike was mentioning, students could find ways to stretch those boundaries, you know, and then be creative um, or even resilient with them. But at the same time, there are various examples of students who did not 
um, overtly conform or give that appearance, like they were caught um, breaking rules or different things. And the discipline would be very harsh at times. And I know students were aware of that and, and brought that up in the oral histories. And then as I did more exploration, which I know uh, this is another area I do want to develop more, is looking at um, boarding school resistance and rebels, you know, who are called rebels, but there's something deeper there than rather like the naughty kids. They were framed as naughty, you know, getting into alcohol or being AWOL or whatever. And the riots, you know, I, I'm really examining as well the terms that are used in these historic documents of what were these riots really? Like what, what spurred them? What, what incited them? What was going on? Um, and so I heard examples of you know, some kind of physical uses of discipline, detention center. Um, there's evidence of heads being shaved if they acted out or Thorazine being used. And so this caught the attention of the American Indian movement and different lawsuits. And so there's a lot there, you know, to look into. But of course, we are looking at a collection that teachers did, did examine and that students who did their work in class, because it was a kind of work, you know, that they were getting credit of, of engaging with the English language. And some of them we didn't even get to talk about, but Mike, you've got to um, share how they were went to competitions and like awards, um, the kind of recognition and and how they actually like like Archie Washburn was a part of a emerging Native authors, you know, who were very well respected. Um, I don't know who was it at the time, Mike. You might be able to bring that up better of the competition that Archie was involved in. I think it had um, some of these award-winning authors. Yeah, so Archie um, actually had one piece published alongside people like N. Scott Mamadi. Thank you. Um, who are at the very forefront of what literary scholars often refer to as the Native American Renaissance. But uh, along with that question, like Farina's pointing out, it's important for us to recognize that censor censorship, while grounded in the same kind of assimilationist agenda, looks very different in a 1950s to 80s boarding school than it does in an 18, you know, 1880s boarding school. Yeah. Um, there's a different way of holding administrators and teachers accountable than would have been present earlier on. But at the same time, we're, as Farina is mentioning, um, there are stories of also administrator or teachers being, being disciplined for allowing too much freedom Yes, for supporting true. students um, in their expression of of identities that were were not conforming to the ones that were um, mm -hmm. prescribed. So, or even the discrimination against um, staff and employees who were uh, people of color or indigenous themselves. There were cases brought up of that. Um, because Brigham City wasn't a predominantly white community, um, heavily influenced by, by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you know, uh, traditionally in, in the old language Mormon community. Um, and there are cases brought up of Native American teachers or staff weren't allowed to take children on field trips. They um, did not have promotion opportunities as other uh, white staff. So this was another part too, and I'm glad Mike brought that up, is um, people also think of boarding schools as like white staff and employees only and native students, but James really brought to light and emphasize and was able to talk to a number of native American instructors like Leo, Put uh, Leo Potero, right, James? You have to talk. Yes, that was Leo. Okay, thank you. Oh, I wasn't sure if you were done answering that question. Okay, um, so this question says, um, were this, I assume this means initially when you first um, contacted them, were the students surprised to learn that you were researching their artwork? Do you want to go start with that, James? Because I yeah. know you really started to reach out to people. 
Yeah, I think they were. Um, you know, there are they were selling work from the very beginning in Intermountain, and you know, a lot of a lot of art ended up in local collections, and uh, people have had these for a long time. A lot of it's obviously disappeared over the years, but um, there were a lot of people who were eager to let us use them and excited that we could use them. Um, and it almost seemed to a certain extent that they knew that there was a time in which this was going to come back out. Um, on the same time, on the same, you know, in the same time though, there were others who were surprised that we were interested in their work. And, and uh, Mike alluded earlier that we went down to a couple of the reunions down at Wheatfields, which is just um, up in the highlands of Arizona. And, uh, you know, um, for Mike and I and, and kind of wondering out there, they were wondering if we had gotten lost, basically. They asked the question, frankly, of like, are you boys lost? So I think um, to have people interested in who they are, where they studied and what they did um, has come as a nice surprise. Yeah, I remember Jesse was really touched and he spoke at our closing reception at the Navajo Nation Museum and he said, I didn't ever think I did anything much. And he was in tears and, and really touched by, you know, an acknowledgement of, of his work. And something I didn't get to share is he was able to actually return home. And that was something, you know, that was com complex too. People ask, you know, how effective was that assimilationist agenda, uh, removal and relocation and other individuals, like you saw some pictures of uh, Lorena Antonio, who worked closely with us and helped us to connect with different alumni. And she is active in, in the gatherings and reunions, um, including the upcoming one that they're planning for in Brigham City uh, this September um, 2022. Um, she lives still in Northern Utah and a number of former students did stay, but she returns home all the time. When COVID hit, she was active, actively gathering donations and driving truckloads of water to her community. I mean, it's incredible. And Jesse returned home to become an art instructor at um, the first Dene uh, community-based schools in his community of Monument Valley and taught some traditional arts like silversmithing and such. So it was really exciting as well to share those aspects of returning to. Just to add to that, to me, the most exciting thing was when we would be in an exhibit space or in like the reunion space and someone would identify an art piece or a poem or something by a relative, like, wait a second, that's my cousin or that's my auntie or, um, and like the, the amount of, like the one image that Farina showed was Jesse Holiday. Farina and I brought him to an elementary school right there in Monument Valley. Um, and so to get to have relatives recognize other relatives as creators, as, as continuing cultural um, practices and knowledge and so on in spaces that have often only been kind of categorized as victim spaces. Um, it's been a really powerful thing to just kind of work through and get to witness is to say, wait a second, no, my, my uncle, my auntie, my grandparent, look at this incredible art that they created even though they were stuck away from home, even though they were limited in all these various ways to practice culture. Um, so that was, that's was that been really exciting to just have these spontaneous like recognitions of relatives. Yeah, I, I recently um, was presenting in Rehoboth, um, New Mexico, which is the Nebequeya, Navajo country. And one of Robert Chi, who is the artist of the main cover image, his daughter was there and spoke and, and shared how hard it has been for her to access, like to even get copies of her father's work, of how difficult that is. And she was just really thankful for the project. And I, I made sure she got a copy of the book and she just wrote you know, the most beautiful message to us. And I'm so grateful and, and happy to develop that relationship. You know, for me, it's a lot about community 
um, sustaining and relationship building and sustaining, you know, because it, it's a lot, you know, to meet all these people and then to support relationships and in, in not just, oh, I'm here to gather your art or like extract it, but no, I'm here. We're here to be sure you see this art and can share it with your grandchildren and his grandchildren, you know, who didn't get to know her father like she did. And she had funny stories where she said she was, um, his daughter, his first daughter, and he wanted a son. So she looked at that picture of uh, the father holding a son and said, that's because he wanted a son. And everyone started laughing, you know, like that, that humor and the story upon story that people can bring up through, through this work was, has been uh, very beautiful. Okay, um, thank you for those answers. This next question is about the parents. Did you find any records of the parents like writing to the school and asking about their children or any reflections or evidence of the parents' experience? Well, I can quickly say yes, absolutely. And it's even in some of their poetry, some of their writings, like Mike might have seen that. I was looking at one the other day, it, it had the title or something of homecoming. And it was talking about how even some family would come and visit and a student was excited. They're coming, you know, they're coming to meet me and my parents are coming. And so I, I did hear that, but I also heard of some really sad and, and difficult stories too of um, there's some families where they didn't have access to a telephone so it was very hard to call and talk. Um, and then writing, in terms of writing, um, a, lot, a lot of students did write that I know of. I knew of some letter writing letters that I've seen. Um, as I also looked at the Latter-day Saint Indian Seminary of the school, I was curious of that. So I found even some archives of letters between students and their parents. I didn't really get as much into this project, um, but I heard of once a student or a situation where the parents didn't know, they didn't know English, you know, they didn't know how to write or to read in English. And so there was that disconnect too, that was really hard for families to communicate in, in a number of situations. And so and that was even more debilitating, like really frustrating for children of having that radio silence because they, if they sent a letter, they were worried, could their family understand it? But I also had heard of some sending letters in, in English or even, you know, maybe trying to write out in Navajo and they would find someone in the community. If there was still an active trading post or something, they would read those letters to the children. So I've heard of those instances, but I don't know if Mike, uh, other ones came to your mind or James. That. Yeah, one of the, the hardest parts of reading through poetry is when students would write about family members who had passed away while they're gone to school. Um, so not being able to be in communal spaces when a parent passes away or a sibling passes away. One of the things that we speak to just briefly um, in the book is also the recognition that while termination policy is happening, like Farina was talking about, and while students, like young kids are being moved away from, from reservation spaces into urban spaces, the federal government is giving leases to the largest uranium mine in the world at that time. Um, that's right there in the Navajo Nation. And so Henry Tinhorn, for example, his father had already passed away from uranium induced illness. Um, and a lot of, of parental figures or ancestors, relatives are, are dying at young, much younger ages than national averages because of the reality of, of mining and other extractive um, industries that are replacing, like as children are being moved away, extractive industries are coming into these same reservation spaces. Um, so that's one of the hard really hard realities of both the oral history side of things as we've built relationships, but also um, captured within their creative writings of grappling with the loss of family members. Yeah, and just quickly, I'd agree with Mike. Uh, I'm obviously biased towards the visual image, but um, 
to answer that question, you do need to read the poetry. And it's there that you see um, just a sense of family and of loss of, you know, anxiety and, and, and eagerness to get back home. Um, I don't know how many poems I read about grandparents and just how much family is a part of them, even though they're removed uh, physically from those they love. Okay, so this question is actually um, my question that's blended with a question that I got from a couple of my students who are taking Native Americans and the law. Um, and we talk a lot in this class about um, discussing and working in areas that are traumatic and challenging and can be emotionally draining. And, um, you know, on the days when I have to teach the Indian Child Welfare Act, for instance, it's like every time I take a deep breath and I walk into the classroom and I say to myself, it's important for my students to understand this history and to understand the law. But at the same time, as a parent myself, you know, I, sometimes it's really hard for me to separate, you know, the history from like my current reality and to, to not put myself in the shoes of, of those who had their children taken away or were led to believe that they would be imprisoned if they didn't send their children away willingly. So the question is really about, you know, how do you um, keep going in this kind of work when it is so taxing and draining and, you know, what motivates you to keep working in these important and incredible spaces? Um, I ended the last one, so let me start with this. Um, it is hard. I have teenagers myself and just imagining having to send them away, having them, you know, removed from me. And it really was hard. And, you know, a lot of the poems and a lot of the things we found don't shy away from that. But it, as we noticed, one of the things that even though we saw all this, uh, these examples of hardship, um, there were always, you know, a poem here or an image there that were just wonderful and just filled with life and just were bright. And um, it didn't always happen, but most often, you know, you get to those poems and you could feel the weight of them, but then you'd get to another series of, of work, of creative works that were just, just beaming with the enthusiasm and, and the, you, and the, you know, the light that only a teenager can have for better or for worse, actually, sometimes as a parent of teenagers. I'll just add to that as well. Um, I had the great opportunity this semester to teach a course. Um, it's called the Native American Rights Seminar. And as part of that, it's a small group of mostly indigenous students and the university gives us funding to travel with them to important sites. Um, and so we went for about a week to South Dakota um, and then into North Dakota into the Standing Rock area. Um, and I mean, we were working through some of the hardest historical and contemporary indigenous spaces in the country. And there were a lot of tears shed and a lot of um, just kind of quiet processing. But when we came back, we did this, these community presentations where the students shared what they had learned with, with um, indigenous community members and others who were interested. And there was this moment of just like complete community where we were grappling with it together. Um, so we, in a way we carry one another's burdens in ways that we as academics often don't do as we isolate ourselves in our offices. Um, and it reminded me also, um, my, my PhD advisor is, a, is just a fantastic indigenous literary scholar, but he talks about how good stories aren't always happy stories, they're just true. Um, and so telling true stories are the things that actually heal us and build us up, not just telling happy ones. And so if we can work through true stories in communal spaces and help to kind of create those spaces of community, um, I found that, that that kind of depressing weight of hard histories and hard realities is, is one that, that brings real relationship rather than further isolation. Well, I think um, that's a really good question because to be honest, 
I didn't want to focus on Native American studies um, as my career. <laughs> I tried focusing on African history <laughs> um, and, and got my master's in African history um, because it, I had to confront and face that for me, it's very personal. Um, you know, these are my relatives. Uh, this is my children. And these are my children. In Dene, as I mentioned, ke, uh, kinship is really close and we're clan related and, and different aspects. But then I felt, you know, a calling home of, I mess up, I make mistakes. I have to remember to be humble. You know, I don't have all the answers, but I really appreciate what was said already of the true stories bring, you, you know, you can't heal without that truth. That's why you often hear truth, um, reconciliation, and healing, because it also takes the reconciliation and rectifying that these there's ongoing everyday acts of violence in different aspects that especially go into law. There's still you know, legal struggles for Dene just to be able to have the right of self-determination of education in Navajo Nation. That is still a struggle of who decides the curriculum. We see this happening even all over, right? All the fights about critical race theory happening in, in my state where I am living of Oklahoma or, or different places of who decides what's being taught, what's being shared, what we're talking about. And for me, you know, I know there's different reasons why people say, oh, don't dwell on the negative. You know, it's the past, get over it. But it's like, when you get hit by a bus, you can't just keep walking on and walk it off. You need to understand what happened and to seek healing and, and the treatment that you need. But sometimes that treatment is going to take, you know, stop, stop the bus from keep hitting you if it's still hitting you, you know, if, if that something is still opening the wounds, you know, you need to see that. And so for me, that's why I do it is I am not ashamed of crying because those tears are water is sacred, water is life. And that's healing for me too, to learn what my ancestors have gone through, including my own, um, you know, aunties, uncles, cousins, my dad. Even my mother, you know, she's not Dene, she's of white settler descent, but learning her trauma of what she's been through in her life, it is empowering for me because I can know and understand them better, understand the situations. And then, you know, that's why history as a historian, I'm very passionate and emphasize it on my soapbox, if you will, or, or whenever I get a chance to is we can't know where we're going if we don't know where we are dropped off or where we landed, right? You don't even know where you are. And if you're kind of like, oh, you can't look at this, you know, what happened, um, that's going to make it really, really hard. And I know it takes step by step because I, I have small children. And even in this, uh, my work, my son wants to ask me, mom, when he was small, are you going to send me to a boarding school? Because he was learning what I was, um, you know, talking about. And that really hit me. But I realized I then I could have an honest, to the best of my ability, try to have a candid conversation with him. And I'm glad he can have that, that I didn't really have. Because it's not like my family were talking around the dinner table about these very traumatic experiences that led me on this journey where I've like, you know, I haven't even told Mike and James this, but in some of these talks with Danae alumni there, a woman came up to me crying and I shed tears with her of where she said, I feel like my childhood was stolen from me. And that was really hard for me, but I was glad I was there to cry with her, you know? and to hear it out. Um, so I know it's worth it and it takes step by step and we'll still trip or whatever as we're trying to learn this process, but do the best we can and, and caring for one another, right? That's the biggest thing of, 
really care and, and listen and learn how to help each other. That is fantastic. Um, and I see that our time is now coming to an end. So I think that's a great place also to end tonight's talk. So I want to thank our panelists again for coming to us virtually to present this important research that they've been doing. And I encourage all of you to um, check out their book. And then I will make sure to follow up to get that GoFundMe link in case anyone here at BLS is interested in donating to um, that um, effort. So thank you again to our panelists. And um, we hope we can welcome you back to VLS, maybe in person someday if, if the pandemic ever ends. And um, thank you also for the, um, the really important work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for listening and joining us on this evening. Hope you all stay well and take care. Thank you.